I'd like us, if we could, please, to turn to 1 John chapter 1. The last time we were with you, we spoke from verses 1 to 4. That was back in July. Let's talk about uh, Jesus. And our revised title is Let's Talk About the Biblical Jesus. And this morning we want to uh, talk about the God who is light. And we'll be focusing on verse 5 with a few thoughts out of verse 6 and 7. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Let us pray. Father, we come into your presence through your righteous Son, Jesus. And we thank you that we can call upon your name and have access into your, into your throne room because of our great high priest. And we are bid to come into your presence with boldness and confidence because of the work of Christ in our behalf. And so this is a wonderful thing. It's not what we strive for it's not what we attain in our own strength it's what christ has done for us that we have this wonderful opportunity to talk to you this morning father we are mindful of many who are suffering at this very moment in all these fires lord we pray that truly most of all people's eyes would be opened to the reality of life and death and may consider how brief life can be and how material things can be burned up in a moment and that people will come to terms with who you are. Understand, Jesus, what you meant when you said that we should lay our treasures up in heaven. We thank you for the blessings, but we are very cognizant of the fact that they are temporary. We enjoy the blessings, but Lord, we don't want to grip them tight because they are in your hands. But Lord, for those that are faced with this fear, we pray that you do a work of grace in the hearts of many people and again remind them of who you are and their need for Christ. Help me, Father, as I come and <clears throat> proclaim your word this morning that I might do so with humility. I might do so, Lord, and speak clearly as I ought to speak, as Paul prayed for himself, that your word might be clear and it's your word that might speak to our hearts and we might be challenged by your word and come face to face with what it says to us personally. That it might not just be a lot of statements about theology or about who you are, but that, Lord, it might have impact in our lives, that it might literally push us in the direction of where you want us to go and how you want us to live. We pray these things in the precious and most wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, we hear good reports about Prairie Chapel, and we are encouraged in how the Lord is multiplying the sheepfold here, particularly due to the faithful preaching of the word from Pastor Mike, and Mike and I have connections, family connections, close friends, and, and the like, and that's, that's kind of neat in a, in a way. Um, we are also part of the the plot to get Mike, weren't we? Before when before he came and people were praying that the Lord would bring him and open his heart and mind to it, and here we are. Look at the Lord has done for you. This is wonderful. And we give thanks to God um, for those who preach and rightly divide his word, which Jesus himself said is truth. And I think about our brothers and sisters especially our brothers who are preaching. I'm thinking of John MacArthur today as he is facing some serious conflict with uh, the authorities and he's taken a very strong stand on the need for um, Christians to meet together without the hindrances of the government. And there's a lot of information out there, but this is what's going on in, in my thinking in, in, in many ways is more than just the issue of COVID. It's, it's a spiritual battle going along and there's a lot of things that are happening with COVID that seem to be politically driven and, and darkness is involved in all of this too. And we want to be healthy, we want to stay safe, we understand that, but there's more to it. And so we need to pray for our churches. I mean, we're limited, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to, to meet together here in British Columbia, but many authorities are, are overstepping their bounds and it's creating all sorts of difficulties and troubles for churches. And so we need to pray for John MacArthur and, and, and those who are going through these very difficult, difficult times in terms of assembling themselves together. So we, but we are thankful for brethren like John and, and those who preach the word and are faithful to it. Well, back in July, we talked about the biblical Jesus from 1 John 1, 1 to 4, stating clearly that it matters what we believe about Jesus. As it was in John's day, so we must be diligent to dismiss the many, many false notions about Jesus in whatever forms they are presented. Right from the get-go, John speaks about, number one, the deity of Christ. He was from the beginning. He is the word of life. He is the eternal life. And he is the source and the grantor of eternal life to everyone who believes in him. In fact, the apostle preached, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. John also speaks of the humanity of Christ, focusing on this in this passage of Scripture. And despite the teachings of the Gnostics who denied Jesus had a human body, the apostles forcefully asserted they beheld him, they heard him, and they touched him. And in John 1.14, when we speak about the incarnation and the celebration we think about around Christmas time, the word became flesh, speaking of God in the Son taking on human form. Or as Paul says in Philippians 2.8, Jesus was found in human form. And then in Paul speaks in 1 Timothy 2.5, and it's significant when you read the words, when Paul says, the man, Christ Jesus, is our only mediator. And so we see this focus on the humanity of Christ. John proclaims these once hidden mysteries to remind us two things from our text in the, in the context of what we're saying. That our fellowship with one another and the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, is anchored in a biblical, not fanciful notion about who Jesus is. It is important. And secondly, 
that seeing believers embrace and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the biblical Jesus brings joy to those who proclaim him. And as I have said to many people many times, if you want to make your pastor filled with joy, grow in Christ, become mature in him, love him, because the goal of the pastor is that you might become perfect and mature and live a life that is exalting to Christ. That's what we are all about. So what we believe about Jesus matters eternally, and eternally matters. In fact, our fellowship and eternity hinges on this very thing. So with John, his fellow apostles, and the saints down through the ages, may we passionately make it our business to know Christ, to love Christ, and to live for his glory. That is the calling of the Christian. After proclaiming his brief but pregnant testimony concerning the God-man Jesus, John now broadens his proclamation to include an attribute of God, which while implied in his gospel is not specifically addressed there. John says this, that God is light. As our text says, this is the message that we heard from him. Jesus, and proclaim to you, that's what preachers do, they announce and proclaim, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. In the broad sense, the term God is light can refer to the Trinity or to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For example, to begin with, we read about Jesus being the light of the world. Speaking about Jesus and quoting prophecy, Matthew writes, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people were dwelling in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Speaking, of course, of Christ. In his gospel, John writes about Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Also in his gospel, John records the claims of Jesus. In John 8, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. That is a very significant claim of Christ. In chapter 12, Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And so we hear to see this focus about who Jesus is. He is the light of the world. I love the way the writer to the Hebrews sums it up in Hebrews 1.3 about Jesus. 
who's saying he is the radiance, the brightness, the effulgence of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus reflects who God the Father is. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. An inscription once carved on the Malrose Abbey ruin in Scotland reads, Christ comes and the shadows depart. Christ comes and the shadows depart because he is light. He is the light. Charles Spurgeon says the superlative beauty of Jesus is all attracting. It is not so much to be admired as to be loved. He is more than pleasant and fair. He is lovely. His whole character we would copy. In all other things we lack some. In him there is all perfection. Christ Jesus is gold without alloy, light without darkness, and glory without cloud. And so we sing about and we preach about Jesus who is the light of the world. But then also there's the Holy Spirit who enlightens and guides us and specifically directs our focus upon Jesus who is the light of the world. But his ministry is to proclaim Christ and to lift Christ up in our midst. He doesn't speak of himself, but he speaks of Christ. Jesus says this in John 16. He says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. Notice that word he, personality, not a force, personality. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, and he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to sum things up. And it follows that which is from him, his written word, it exposes and it guides us. For example, in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In Proverbs 6, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instructions are the way of life. So when considering our text, the message that we heard and proclaim to you from him, Jesus, the one whom we have heard, seen, and touched, is clear. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, it is fair to say that when Jesus speaks of God in this way, he is not specifically, or he is speak, speaking specifically of his heavenly Father. James no doubt learned this truth from Jesus and speaks of the Father using the terms the Father of lights from James chapter 1. He states, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures so when trying to comprehend what our lord is teaching we need to carefully dig into the declarative statement that god is light and while doing this it is important to understand that when speaking about any attribute of God, we are limited by our own human faculties. And when it comes to our study of theology, which one preacher defined this way, he said it's simply right thinking about God. We must approach this discipline prayerfully, with great care and deep humility, like the psalmist who writes in Psalm 139. He says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. 
You discern my going out and my lying down, and you're familiar with all my ways. Before, before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. Now think about this. What is the psalmist thinking about? He's overwhelmed about his God is, who his God is. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. In Romans chapter 11, in verses 33 to 35, Paul writes this about who the God he had just finished speaking about in Romans 9 to Romans 11, which is really brings us to our knees as we read about who God is. And Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? If you remember Job when he was going through his difficulties and he was hurting, he had lots of pain, and he kind of got into the mode of, of, of wondering, what is it with all of this suffering? I've been faithful, I've been righteous, and he and he started to, to, to grumble or complain and, and couldn't, couldn't make sense of things. Now, we understand that there's things in life that we can't make sense of. And so we're just like Job in, in so many ways like this. And, and so he bears his soul, and, and then God answers him. He reminds Job of who he's talking to. And Job's response was this in Job chapter 40. He says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And so when we come and we speak of God, it's too easy to be flippant and lighthearted and make statements that are out of out of sort for believers because when we come to God, the thing that we come to see is that we put our hands over our mouth. And God is so awesome and so beyond us, we can't comprehend who he is. So as we consider the phrase, God is light, it's natural then to ask, what does this word light tell us about God himself? But we do so carefully because we want to, to drink from his word on this point. The first thing is this affirmation itself, and it's couched both in a positive and a negative statement. When we say God is light, we are saying that is what he is along with all of his attributes, like those mentioned in 1 John 1, 9, that God is, is faithful and just. Or in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Now it's important when we come to study the attributes of God that we take them as a whole and not carve off just one attribute and think about God only in that light. But we think of the whole of his attributes. And that's why the study of God becomes sometimes very challenging, complicated, because our minds cannot comprehend the one that we seek to know the one we seek to study. We can begin to explore, but we'll never ever come to an end of understanding who our great mighty God is. There's also this negative affirmation in verse 5 as well. It says, in him there is no darkness at all. It is a both sides of the coin kind of statement. Now, some of you have been out camping, and I'm not sure how you were fed. Some of it might have been kind of raw. Some of it might have been cold. Some of it burnt. I'm not sure if you've got some good cooks in the house or you just do what some men do and just eat it and get on with it. But, 
But if I ask you the question, if I ask you the question, how is your appetite? You might answer, I am full. <laughs> I always like to say I'm fed up. <laughs> but, uh, or you might say, I am not hungry. The same thing, spoken positively and negatively. <clears throat> it is the same thing said in two different ways. And this is what this text tells us about God, who is light. He is light, and there's no darkness in him at all. In Psalm 139, the psalmist says this in verses 11 and 12, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. In other words, there's no place to hide from God. In giving thanks to God for revealing King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel prays, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. And so we see that God is light. The second thing we learn about God from him being light is the God who is light refers to his holiness, to his purity, to his perfections, to his splendor and blazing glory. You know what it's like to get up early in the morning in your dark bedroom and walk into the bathroom and experience temporary blindness when you turn the lights on. You know what that's like. When looking at the sun or laser lights, we can understand that that causes, can cause permanent blindness. Oh, the bathroom trip takes trips only a few, few moments to recover. Um, facing the light in, in a bright manner can cause permanent blindness for people. You may recall the tragic story of the three police officers who were blinded by laser lights aimed at them by the rioters recently in the United States. It was a serious situation for them. And if we are so easily blinded by earthly lights, how much more can we expect to stand in the presence of God who is light and not be blinded? In Exodus chapter 33, God says to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on him whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And so this is what it's like to look in the presence of God. We cannot even behold his glory directly and expect to live. Matthew Henry comments, he says, he is all that beauty and perfection that can be represented to us by light. He is self-active, uncompounded spirituality, purity, wisdom, holiness, and glory, and the absoluteness and fullness of excellency and perfection. There is no defect or imperfection, no mixture of anything alien or contrary to absolute excellency, not mutability or capacity of any decay in him. In him is no darkness at all. This is the God that we worship. The scriptures also speak of the God who is light as one who exposes darkness. And this is where theology teachings about the scriptures about who God is pushes in to our lives and it starts to make us feel uncomfortable. We may run from God, but we cannot hide from him. In Psalm 139, the psalmist says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. In Proverbs 15, we read that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, observing 
the evil and the good. In Jeremiah 23, we read, Can a man hide in secret places where I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? And then that passage of scripture in John 3 where Jesus speaks of the real condition of, our, of the hearts of man. And he says, and this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. In her latter years, my dear mother developed a phobia of a fire starting with hot, bright lights. Anything 60 watt or 100 watt and that she was, she was nervous about. So she had a 25 watt light bulb placed above her kitchen table her, where she ate. When I visited her one evening, I, I said in effect, Mom, how can you see anything clearly in this room? It is so dark. And so I upgraded the bulb to either a 60 or 100, can't remember. But when I installed that bulb, I said, what a change. Everything is so much more brighter. I, we can actually see and enjoy one another. But then I noticed something that was not so apparent before the light upgrade. And that were the stains on my mother's dress. See, this is what light does. It exposes the stains. It exposes our iniquity. It exposes our sins, and we can't run, and we can't hide. When we come before the bright light of God's holy word, our iniquities are exposed for what they are, as we read in Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now think about that for a moment. How, what does that say about who our God is? That our God knows our thoughts even before we think them as, as the psalmist says. But God knows the thoughts of every person at every moment of every day in life, from all eternity to the future, God knows these things and what we're thinking. We cannot escape who he is. Of course, the way many cope with that is they simply deny God. They deny he exists. They don't want to deal with this reality, this accountability that one day, as the scriptures say, it's appointed a man wants to die, and then the judgment. But for the Christian, this leads us to our fourth point. We understand that when we speak of these things, it's not exhaustive. Time doesn't permit us. And we can only start really in the study of who God is in terms of him being light because the study can keep going and going and going beyond what the ever-ready battery advertises to do. The scriptures speak of the God who is light, believing, being the believer's guide and comfort, and, and this is important. The wonderful thing about the mercy of God is that the one to whom we are held accountable is the one who has dealt with our need and our sin that stood in between us and our fellowship with him through the work of Christ on the cross. And when we've put our trust in Christ, the Bible says that all of our sins are forgiven, and we have this fellowship with God, this interaction with God, and John speaks about this fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, and therefore the spin out of that is the fellowship that we have together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But when we speak of the scriptures or the God who is light, we read, for example, in Job 29, when his lamp shone on my head and by his light I walk through 
the darkness. We think about darkness in our lives and depression and discouragement. We come to his word and find help in our time of need. In Psalm 27, we read, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In Psalm 84, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. In Psalm 36, for with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. In Proverbs 6, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And then Isaiah invites us in Isaiah 2, Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And so we ask, what is our personal response to the truth that God is light? It is breathtaking as we think about this in our own lives. And yes, it is frightening And biblical theology, when we study God and we learn about God, has life-changing implications for us in the way we live from day to day. When we know our God, we walk in a different path than we would if we simply ignored him and walked in darkness along with the world. Consider Isaiah, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we get snippets of that. We, get, we are able to taste that from time to time, even when we behold God's creation. I work part-time across the road at Timmerman's Landscaping as a yard man. And when I drive out to the valley, except perhaps when it's smoky out. I behold the wonders of God, often stop my car, and I take pictures of the drive out here. And it's just wonderful, wonderful. Then I love to post them on Facebook and get all these likes. They like, people like it too. They love to see the glory of God displayed. And that's a taste. That's one taste of it. When we behold the heavens and we see the stars, and we see how God can take a, a somebody whose life is absolute and ruin and turn it around and, and he has a new purpose or she has a new purpose in living for the glory of God and they have a new life in Christ. We see the glory of God displayed. But Isaiah here refers to the fact of who God is. And part of the fact that God is light is seen in his holiness And the whole earth is full of his glory. And the text says, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is what happens when we encounter the God of light. We have that sense of drawing back, becoming aware of our sinfulness and our unworthiness to even be a part of what we're proclaiming here this morning. And yet, as we read, the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from, with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is what we have in Christ. Our atonement 
the forgiveness of our sins. And this is why we have access, based upon the work of Christ, into the very presence of God, and we can call him our Father because of what Christ has done for us and have this fellowship with him. I'm reminded of the story, as I'm often reminded of it, is of the publican who was standing afar off. Now, this is in contrast to the self-righteous religious teacher, the Pharisee. And understand the thing that God hates more than anything in us is our pride. And that would, would, which would bring focus upon ourselves and cause boasting of what we have done. See, to come to Christ means we lay it all down. We have nothing to bring to him. We only can receive from him what he gives to us, his righteousness, his life. We have nothing to bring to God. There is nothing in us that is deserving, that earns his mercy. And, and the publican, the tax collector, the man who people despised, the sinner, he understood this. He understood how it was between him and God that he was the sinner. And, and he beat his breast. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. That's the sense. When someone gets right to God, they come to see who they are before a holy God, the God who is light, who exposes sin. See, that's where it has to come. It's not just a matter of saying a prayer and kind of getting with it and becoming a member of the church. We have to come to the place to see who we are before a holy God, the God of light who exposes us. And that will either drive us two ways. It will either drive us into hardness of heart, Because if we follow through in the context of Isaiah here, those he preached to, none of them responded. He simply declared God's message. And that's what we do. God is the one who causes things to grow. We water plant. He is the one that works in people's hearts and causes things to grow. But this publican said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, Jesus said, that this man went down from his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so a question I ask, and this text presses in upon us when we speak of the God of light, so that it's not just an academic thing, but that it's a personal thing. Have you, with bowed heart, come to the God who is light? Have you called upon him for mercy? Have you called upon the one who knows all about you, regardless of your station in life, and he knows who you are? And the good news is that if you know who you are as a sinner, you know that Jesus came into the world to save you. He came into the world to save sinners. In the confession of King David, he prays, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. What does he despise? Pride, self-righteous justification, the argument of who I am, the one who boasts. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 1 that let him who boasts, boast in the Lord because of the work Christ has done. John sums it up clearly. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, we understand that we do not have to be afraid of this God who is light. In fact, We are bid to walk in the light with him as we follow him. So in conclusion, let us be clear. In light of who God is, the God of light, John calls out duplicity. He calls out hypocrisy. He calls out two-facedness. He calls out insincerity and phony confessions of faith. You know, it's easy to say, I am a Christian when things are going well. But it's another thing to really follow after the God who is light. For example, in verse 6, we read, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie 
and do not practice the truth. And there are many who have given testimony to the fact, yes, I put my trust in Jesus a long time ago, but they're walking in the way of the flesh. They're walking in the way of the world. They're walking in darkness. There, there's no difference between them and those in the world. But they say, yeah, but I'm going to heaven because there was a time in my life when I put my trust in Christ. What does Paul say about that? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. And so there's this challenge. It's not that we don't struggle with sin. It's not that we don't fall on our faces. Because if you study the scriptures, you see that all the saints had to do battle with sins. And they were challenged in the scriptures to put to death our sinful nations, to do battle with our sins. But what we're dealing with is those who lazily live their lives in a way that their idea of sin doesn't bother them anymore. And they can sin without their conscience being seared. And to them, John says, you lie. And you do not practice the truth. But, if we read verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, this morning, we just don't have time to dig into all of this. But this verse reminds me of that song that goes like, I saw the light. (laughs) There's no more darkness and no more night. Simply put, Coming to the light leads to cleansing. It leads to holiness and walking in fellowship with one another. Yes, it matters what we believe about Jesus, and so it matters if we confess to have fellowship with God, who is light, that we walk in the light. I want to close this morning with a reading from Ephesians 5, and it kind of gathers together everything that we have talked about and lays it out for us so what it means to walk in the light and in fellowship with the God who is light. And it's challenging. And it's very direct. And it calls us, in many cases, to repentance and to turn from sin, to turn from walking in darkness and living for the glory of God. Paul says in Ephesians 5, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us. I love that, and the way it's put there, because the Christian life is always a responsive thing. It's loved, it, it's lived in response to what Christ has done for me. So we love the way Christ has loved us. And that helps us get through a lot of a lot of baggage, a lot of difficulties in our life, and sometimes where we don't want to love. And, and we're just reminded we always come back to the cross. That's where our starting point is as believers. And he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure that no immoral or impure or greedy person, such as a person who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live 
as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that understanding just a little bit more of a long journey in understanding who God is, that when we look at the fact that God is light, that he leads us to walk in the light. And that as we walk in the light, then we will have fellowship with one another and will avoid walking in the darkness. May God give us the grace and the heart and the desire to do so. Father, when we consider who you are. Um, we do our best to try to explain things, but you are beyond us and past beyond finding out. We only know about you as you have revealed yourself to us and you have in your word. What a holy God you are. You're beyond anything we can even imagine. When people come and they try to explain you or, or, or they attack you, what do they know? They're, they're, they're human. They, they don't know much. They really don't. Help us to walk humbly with you, Lord. To understand just a little bit about you leads us to, to bow low before you, to bow the knee, to, to, to even have a taste of your glory causes within our hearts a welling up of praise and, and a shouting of amen and hallelujah as we consider your wonder. To think that you know our thoughts from afar. To think that you know the thoughts of everyone. Even before they think them. And you know the thoughts of everyone in this world from all time to eternity. At every moment you know what every person is thinking. Nothing escapes you. How can we even grasp this? But God, you are who you are. and We are man who we are. We're weak and we're... We're in need of you, and we're in need of your grace. We thank you for that which we have in Christ. And I just pray that we would walk out of this place this morning with a sense of humility, a sense of wonder, a sense of your glory, as we consider the God who you are, the God of light. And may it have impact in our lives that leads us to walk in the light for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.